Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So I usually start with an introduction slide, but here we said everything already. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here again at this uh, conference after COVID. I always like this event a lot, so um, great to give a talk about it today. So um, the topic is, of course, how to scale uh, Nextcloud from very big, uh, from very small instances to very big instances. Um, but for that, I think it's helpful that I start a little bit about what is actually Nextcloud, what do you want to achieve. Um, then a little bit of a feature overview, it's important for the context, then the actual scaling, um, um, and then at, at the end, two case studies, one Magenta Cloud and one um, Claro Drive for America Mobile. So first, um, uh, what is Nextcloud in the first place? Um, some of you might know it already. Um, we are a content collaboration platform. <clears throat> This is a little bit of a history slide that I often use. It basically shows that the file server is a bit of our grandpa. This is where everything is coming from, like from the, from the 80s uh, and 90s. Um, then a um, little bit later in the 2000s, the um, file sync and share um, market basically came into existence which basically can do everything a classic file server can do, but it also has a web interface, it has mobile access, it has versioning, it has a trash bin encryption and so on. So it can already a little bit more. This is of course Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive and so on. Um, but for me it was always clear that the future is a real collaboration platform um, where you also have like editing of documents, um, uh, chatting, video conferencing, email and so on and so on. And of course we see this nowadays with Microsoft 365, Google Workspace, and, and all the others. So this is what, what we do. This is why we have our product structured in this core four blocks. There's Nextcloud Files, which is the file sync and share part. Nextcloud Talk, which is chat and video conferencing. Groupware for mail, calendar, and contacts. And then Office for editing of uh, uh, Office documents, all under the umbrella of Nextcloud Hub. Now, Nextcloud Hub is basically the, the umbrella brand here. So very similar to what Microsoft is doing, what Google is doing, also what Zoom is doing, and so on. Of course, you might wonder, okay, great. So what's the difference? Of course, there is a really, really important difference, which is that everything here is open source, and everything can run on-premise. So you can just take all the software, put it on in any infrastructure you want, and you have your local collaboration platform as alternative to Microsoft and Google and others. Right, and it's of course also why I'm here, because again, we don't host Nextcloud. It's not a SaaS solution as the others. It's just software you download from our website and you put it on some infrastructure. This of course means that you also need to scale it, as I said, from very small to very big. So Nextcloud runs um, on a Raspberry Pi for three users at home. It also runs on a big uh, cluster setup for 20 million users. And it's basically the same software. And I'll show you a little bit later uh, how this works. But first, a little bit of a feature overview. Um, lots of you might know it already, so I'll be relatively quick here. Let's start with Nextcloud files. Um, if you log in for the first time, you see this. It's a dashboard. You can basically see what's going on, what are the recommended files that I should have look at, are there any chat messages, are there any events, and so on. All these widgets are customizable. You can see what's, what's happening. Then if you click in the files, on the files icon, you see, of course, the file interface um, for uploading, downloading, sharing, versioning, and so on files. It's just a file manager. It's all the features, but it's not that exciting. It's just a file manager. Um, of course, it has all the advanced features, for example, versioning. You can always go back into older versions of a document, view them. You can compare them with the current version. So it has quite this lot of those power features. There's a templating system, you want to create a new file, you can pick from existing templates. Um, there is a, a project feature where every directory, you can have this section on top where you can document what is in the directory. It's very helpful if you're a big organization, you want to say, okay, here is where the, I don't know, the vacation requests go or something like that, can be uh, documented and it's also visible on desktop and mobile, of course. There's file logging. So if you want to uh, work on a file, for example, I don't know, you're offline in a plane, you don't want anyone else to touch the file to avoid sync conflicts, you can lock the file and unlock it. There's a photo uh, gallery, photo management. As I mentioned, there are mobile clients. They are also open source, freely available mobile clients for iOS, for Android, where you can really do everything again with the files, edit something. Okay. 
um, everything you, you, you want. Um, there's a push notification system where you get notification if something interesting happens, if a file that you marked as favorite is touched, for example, or if you mentioned in a chat or something else on all your devices. There are desktop clients for Mac, Windows, and Linux that work very similar to Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox. They're synchronizing your files from your desktop to the server bi uh, bidirectionally. It also has advanced features like the file locking that I mentioned earlier. So if you edit a document uh, locally, if you uh, open an Office, uh, do uh, Office document with Word, for example, or PowerPoint, uh, or even a, a Photoshop file, it's automatically locked on the server, so no one else can edit it at the same time. That's a new feature. There are really advanced authentication options with two-factor and hardware um, tokens and so on. Uh, we have quite some security features. For example, you can restrict who can do what from where. For example, as an administrator, you can create rules that files that are tagged as secret um, can only be accessed from the internal network at office hours from devices that have a certain certificate on it, for example, and only this if you're in a special LDAP group. So you can put all of this together, and it's quite um, powerful to restrict uh, data flow. There's an end-to-end -end encryption system. So um, uh, it works that this is integrated into the mobile and the desktop apps. Um, so it works in a way that on the server, so if the server is compromised or the administrator is not trusted, there's no way to um, access the files. Um, and we also implement it like sharing now, for example, file drop features is quite, quite powerful. There's a feature called Data Access Engine, so you can mount different data sources into your next cloud. So if you have an existing SharePoint server or some file server, you can mount this into your next cloud directory and you can do this as a user or as an admin, it's quite useful. There's a quite powerful um, unified search built-in. So on the top you can type in, I don't know, Christmas party, and you can find all the files, all chat messages, all emails, all, all project management to-dos, um, and everything else around that topic. A very interesting feature um, is a federation. And this is, of course, a little bit unusual, because as I said, the solutions from Microsoft and Google and Slack and Zoom and so on, they are SaaS solutions, and they only exist once on the planet, obviously, hosted by these companies. While Nextcloud exists many, many times. Actually, it's possible to have, like, uh, there are actually hundreds of thousands of people running uh, a Nextcloud server. Um, so the question is, of course, how can they collaborate with each other? And there we have this federation feature. So with this feature, you can have a shared folder, or two people can have a shared folder if the people are on different servers. Right, they have uh, my home next cloud, and there's a next cloud at a university or the, some company or my soccer club, or I don't know. They, we can all have like shared folders and work together while they're physically on different machines. So this is the basic um, next cloud files functionality. Next cloud talk is of course chat and video conferencing with all the usual feature features. It's an alternative to Zoom. Skype, WebEx, Slack, and so on. Again, with the difference that everything runs on your server can be deployed wherever you want. This enables very interesting use cases. For example, working together with the, um, with the German government. Um, as you know, Germany has uh, lots of embassies all over the world. They're connected with VPN connections. And with the help of Nextcloud Talk, they can have video calls and chatting with each other on a network that's disconnected from the internet, a completely internal network. And this is, of course, only possible with a solution like that. Um, from a functionality perspective, it's quite standard chat interface. Um, very cool is that you can integrate all kinds of other content. So you can uh, link your files in there, calendar inv uh, invites, here, GitHub issues, or anything else into the chat. Of course, there are video calls, also with mobile clients, screen sharing capabilities, all the usual features. Then we have a new... Um, call recording features, the calls can be recorded, also new with a, with a new transcript feature now, using some machine learning. Um, there are polls and other solutions or breakout rooms available. There are mobile clients, um, iOS and Android, again, you can chat and do video calling from your phone, again, everything talking to, to your machine, right? No data is going anywhere else. A desktop client, also with call notifications, get a nice notification, someone calls you. So all the, all the useful features. Of course, this is all integrated. For example, here on the left side, uh, next lot files, if you look at the PDF, 
legally have a chat on the other side where you can just discuss with people what's in the PDF, what needs to be changed, and so on. Group fair, um, calendar with all the usual features, quite standard. There's a mail client with all um, the requested powerful features like GBG encryption, S-MIME encryption, uh, delayed sending, um, and so on. And a project management tool, Nextcloud Deck, for a Kanban board. Uh, and a very new feature is an exchange connector. So we can actually talk with an exchange server. So you can use Nextcloud as a front end and keep your existing infrastructure in your company if you want. Then the first, fourth pillar is, of course, Nextcloud Office. Start with a um, text editor. We have a quite nice collaborative markdown editor with all the usual features. Again, you can have a video call and chat while you work together on the same document. Quite nice. And of course, a full office suite to edit like yeah, text documents, spreadsheets, PowerPoints, drawings, and so on. Again, with the integration of Nextload Talk while editing documents. Okay, I think. I don't know if you're getting a bit boring here because there are a lot of standard features I just mentioned. But now in the next segment, I want to um, mention something which is, I think, a bit more interesting and actually our work around machine learning and AI that we did in the last few months. So um, the whole AI topic is, of course, very hot. A lot of um, companies um, implement this and integrate into their product. Um, but of course, this is a bit of a privacy um, and security nightmare. Right? As you know, it's quite um, critical with access to what data. Companies use your personal data to train machine learning models, and uh, the question is, is this really good? Then the CO2 footprint, discrimination, and lots of other things. So we developed this ethical AI rating system where we have these four requirements. Um, that the code should be open source, because only if the code of these AI features is open source, then you can actually check what it's doing, and you can also improve it and improve the efficiency, and so on. The model should be freely available, because only then you can run them locally as you want. And the training data also should be, um, should be freely available, because then you can check if there's any bias in there, or you can improve it over time, retraining, and so on. So from our perspective, these are requirements for, for ethical AI, and we have this traffic light system to check the different features for that. So now I'm telling you a few things that are actually a bit new, because actually next Saturday, um, we have the launch of our next big version, Nextcloud Hub 6. So um, I can't help myself and talk already a bit of about some features, so we get a sneak preview here. Um, so what we do is that we actually, uh, this was too fast. Uh, what we do is actually um, having a system where every AI feature in Nextcloud can be configured by the admin and you can choose which backend to use. For example, for the translation system, you can say, hey, I want to have an e on people or um, ChatGPT, but you can also use our own translation system, which runs locally on the server. You can configure this as an admin. The same for speech-to-text features, as I mentioned before. Or you get a transcript of a video call. You can choose if this is something that's used like an online service, like um, the, the Whisper online service from OpenAI, or our own local open source um, alternative to that, and so on. This basically goes through all the different features, and every user of Nextcloud is in full control if an online AI service is used or our local one. Okay, this gives you really a lot of a lot of flexibility there. But the big thing is, of course, that we are launching a new system called Nextcloud Assistant, which is a large language model-based um, system. This is 100% open source, and it can run 100% on your server. So this is a system that you can use for different features. I will show it you in a second. And this guarantees, again, that it's no bit is leaving your server. Everything is local. There are quite some features already, some of them for for a few months. Some of them are brand new. It really goes from face recognition to object recognition. There's a smart in mail. Um, we have a translation system. There's a dictation system, um, some text generation features, and everything runs completely local. So this is quite unique. I don't think there's another collaboration solution in the world which has all these advanced features completely open source and completely local. This is quite unique. So, of course, this is integrated into the apps. Here, for example, in mail, you see on top a summary of a mail thread. 
So maybe you get a long mail thread and just don't want to read everything. You can get a summary on top of it. And this is um, using a large language model running. It runs completely local. Of course, it can also be used to write your mails. So if, for example, he can say, hey, give me an email for a birthday party invitation, and it can generate the, the mail for you, obviously. Then in every place in Nextcloud where you have some text, you can mark the text, and then on the side can say, hey, I want to generate a headline, I want to reformulate that, I want to translate it, or I want to do something else with it. Again, very similar to ChatGPT, but on your device, completely open source. There's also a way to do um, image generation. For example, in a chat channel, uh, you want to do some brainstorming about something, can give it a prompt and generate an image, which is then directly inserted. And there's a, uh, um, a speech-to-text system, too, where if you want to dictate a chat message or a mail, you can do the two again, open source and local. We have a system for sus suspicious logins, so we can detect sp uh, suspicious logins. For example, if someone logs in in the middle of the night from a different continent, then we can detect it automatically, also using an, a local um, on-the-fly trained machine learning model. And we have a way to do classification of documents. So for example, you can say, hey, want to check all uploaded documents, or oh, this uh, contains credit card numbers or social security numbers, and then we can automatically tag it. And again, with the, with the access control feature I showed you earlier, we can say that, I don't know, confidential documents cannot be shared outside your organization, for example. So this is quite, um, quite cool. And again, everything local and everything open source and transparent. So this is the overview about the functionality that we do at Nextcloud. Now I want to talk about scaling it. Right, this is obviously the real topic here. So um, as I said, I'm quite proud that Nextcloud scales from very, very small to very, very big. Right? It really starts from a Raspberry Pi. We have like hundreds of thousands of users all over the world who run it on the Raspberry Pi at home, all the features. I personally would not recommend it too much. There's not a lot of fail tolerance here, and the speed is very limited. But you can do it if you want. I mean, this is suitable for one to 10 users, I would say. Um, to deploy it, it's quite simple. Uh, the core of Nextcloud is still PHP-based. It's, it's just a zip file. You take it, you unpack it in your web root of your web server, and it basically works. Right? This is everything, everything works out of the box. Um, there are some ways to do it a bit more convenient. There is a, um, a community project called Nextcloud Pi, which is a distribution, which is basically everything is pre-configured, everything you want. You can just put it on your Raspberry Pi, um, and it works. Uh, and we are also building uh, something called Nextcloud All-in-One, which is a, a Docker image, which also has everything nicely pre-configured and everything in there. You can just put it on there and it, and it works. Of course, I only show this like for fun because I would not really recommend it on running a Raspberry Pi, but it works. Most people probably run it on something like that, which is just a normal Linux box, right? So it works on a single, uh, Linux server. I would say if you look at our users and customers, this can work up to 10,000 users on one machine. It really depends how it's used, but it's quite fast. Um, of course, now it gets a little bit more complicated, right? Because just unzipping a zip file and think that it works for 10,000 users, this does not really work anymore. So now we get into the space where we need a little bit more configuration. So the first thing that is needed is um, there's Redis is recommended. It's not really needed, but it's, uh, it's recommended. It's, it's a, use, a fast way to store some, some things like file locking information, for example, which makes it a lot faster. Then obviously you should use a real database, right? because by default it's using just a SQLite, which is fine for three users, but um, obviously you, you should use a real database, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, um, Oracle theoretically also works, but yeah, Oracle. Um, <laughs> um, then storage is of course a question. Um, you can use the local storage on this machine, but a lot of people need more storage for this amount of users, so you basically connect some NFS storage or some S3 storage typically with that. And then it is recommended to do a few more things, to use our performance backend for files, high performance backend for talk, and a very new thing, again, launch on Saturday, uh, our OCS uh, microservices. I'll tell you more about it 
have these next slides here. So the first thing is um, the high performance backend for files. So the thing is, um, we are quite happy with doing the core of Nextcloud in PHP for a lot of reasons, also some scalability reasons I'll show you in a second. But of course, PHP comes with some architecture restrictions. For example, you cannot really have a, a WebSocket connection open to your clients because it's request-based. But we have here with this high-performance backend, that's an, um, um, an optional component that you can use. It's written in Rust. Um, and this basically has open connections to all the clients and also to the web interface. And this enables some things. So first of all, it means that everything is updated like instantly. If you click here, it's updated on the other side in the same, in the same second. Um, it also removes the need for the clients to pull the server all the time to ask, is there a change, is there a change, is there a change? So this basically means reducing the server request by a factor of 10. And you get yeah, instant notifications, and this also can be clustered. It's also completely open source, as everything we do. But this is something, an additional service, that is recommended to be installed for these bigger systems. This is not out of the box. It requires to run like a daemon, of course. Then we have the second component that is recommended, which is the high-performance backend for Torque. Um, this is a, has a bunch of services. It's also um, an, uh, another uh, daemon. This is written in Go. Um, it also has open WebSocket connections to the Torque client in this case, but also has additional things that is needed for video conferencing, um, like a stun server, turn server, an MCU, and some other components including a SIP bridge. Because by default, Nextcloud Talk does the video calls peer-to-peer. -peer. So every video stream is sent from every participant to, an, to the client of the another participant, which is great. Great requires no configuration, very secure. Um, but of course, the number of connections grows exponentially with the number of participants. Right? So this is realistically, you cannot really have a video call with more than five people. Um, so, but with this component, it goes through a central instance, which does the signaling, and it scales a lot better. So you can have uh, calls with lots of we, no, we had calls with 1,000 people. That's not a problem. And then the third component, this is something very new, is um, our new API, for uh, which we call Open Collaboration Services. This is a new API to develop apps and extensions. Um, because um, so far, all the apps need to be developed also in PHP. Here, you can develop these extensions and apps with every programming language you want. And we have SDKs for Python, Rust, TypeScript, and Go already ready. And this is using more like a microservice architecture. So these components that can work like uh, run on a different process and can actually even work on a different machine. Um, and this is, for example, important for our machine learning things, because there are a lot of them are written in Python. They also require um, different hardware. For example, it's recommended to have CPU in it. Um, you might not have this in the main server, so you want to offload it to a different machine. And this is working with the new microservices architecture that we are introducing. But now let's talk about the really important thing, because like scaling it beyond one machine, right? This is what we are here for. Um, so the architecture is quite standard to do that, to do it in a cluster setup. Right? It basically requires to have a load balancer. You have a lots of application servers. You can have lots of them. Um, we have some customers who have hundreds of those. Um, and then you have some backend services like a database, storage, um, um, a Redis cluster, and of course then um, maybe a cluster of uh, AI services, as I just mentioned. So something like that, uh, I would say, works up to 5 million users. I have a case study about this in a second. Um, this scales very, very nicely horizontally. And I want to um, <laughs> say something about PHP here. PHP is not the most popular language nowadays, but it has really some um, advantages. For example, you don't really have a shared state between different PHP processes at all. You don't have any shared memory or nothing, which means every request is completely isolated from another, which means you basically, if you have double the number of application servers, you can really process double the number of requests. That's a really nice thing about PHP. So the limitations actually become a, a benefit here. Um, so this can be run on bare metal. We have customers and users who deploy in lots of different ways. You can run it on, on bare metal. Lots of them do use virtual machines. 
um, some others use it uh, containerized uh, in a Kubernetes setup. So this, we are agnostic there. Um, this is all possible. Now let's dive into like a concrete example, which you might know, which is Magenta Cloud from Telecom. So Magenta Cloud from Telecom is a service that has uh, 3.6 million users. Um, this is using Nextcloud. Um, it is it's running under OTC, the Open Telecom Cloud, which is uh, Kubernetes-based. Um, it's online since 1.5 1 years. Um, and what I personally find very interesting is that the migration project took uh, over a year. And not because of the technical complication, it's actually not that complicated. It took one year to copy the data. <laughs> yeah. So the previous service was running by a different organization, a different hosting center. It copied like for a year over the internet. Yeah. And Telecom or T-Systems, they have quite some infrastructure, but it still took, took a year. Um, so um, the architecture, I don't want to go into too much detail. It's using the Open Telecom Cloud. It's quite standard Kubernetes-based setup. It's actually running on different um, uh, two different uh, locations, two, two different hosting centers. Um, it's very, it's quite textbook Kubernetes, which means the number of application servers um, is going up and down dynamically all the time. So it's running on less nodes at night than at daytime. Um, and this all yeah, works great. The, the state is preserved, and it's quite successful. Of course, with the proper um, deployment system, um, Terraform, all the usual things. You know it better than me. Um, it's quite stable and fast, faster than the service before. And I think it's... Uh, Quite a quite a success story, and again, it's, I personally find it um, cool. It's basically the same code that's running on a re your Raspberry Pi. So now I want to go to a next um, example because I said 3.6 million users, but in the headline about 20 million users, right? So you're wondering where are the 20 million users, and this uh, leads me then to the second case study, um, and this is something uh, a service called Claro Drive probably don't know it. Um, it's operated by a company called America Mobile. They're based in Mexico um, and they're supplying, I don't know, most of Latin America, basically. So America Mobile has 380 million customers, um, quite big. Uh, 20 million of them use Nextcloud um, on this service called, called Claro Drive. So this is basically um, the next level of scalability. Because as I showed you earlier in the cluster setup, I said like scales up to 5 million users. I mean, these, all these numbers are relative, right? Depends how you use it. But um, at some point, like a cluster comes also to its, to its um, uh, limitations. For example, that just the uplink of the data center is not big enough. Or you just want to have redundancy of more than one data center. Right? So for that, we have something uh, special, special architecture, and this is what we call global scale. Um, so this is enables to scale to more than 5 million users. You could imagine it like a cluster of clusters, basically. You have like all these clusters that I showed you earlier on the different uh, hosting centers, but this enables you to have a service that is the combination of different clusters and different hosting centers on different continents, maybe even run by different organizations. Um, this is also very cost efficient um, because at some point scalability becomes expensive. Right? For example, databases, it's not so hard to scale them to like, I don't know, three, four, five nodes um, in a MySQL MariaDB cluster. But going beyond that becomes really expensive. You need to have a different solution. And this is why we have, have that. So the way it works is, is like that. Um, here you have the different sites. These are basically the different clusters that I showed you earlier. You can imagine like the Magenta Cloud architecture being in here and here and here and here. And, and they can run on different continents. In the case of this setup, they have four sites. I think one is in Mexico, one in Argentina, one in Brazil, and the fourth, I don't remember. 
but um, they basically have these different hosting centers, different clusters on in different um, different countries. Okay. On top, you have a, a component called Global Site Selector. You can imagine it's something like the login page, basically. You go to the URL, cloudrive. I don't know what the URL is, and you can authenticate. Or, of course, if you're already authenticated, you have a cookie, it still doesn't matter, you still go to this thing. Then what it does, it asks a, a lookup server, which is another component we have, like, hey, there is this user who wants to log in. Where is this user located? And the lookup server returns the information, okay, this user is in the hosting center of Sao Paulo, for example. And, and then the global site selector redirects the user to the right hosting center. And then it's, use, it's working locally there. Okay. What's still possible is, of course, they can still collaborate and share information with people or users on different hosting centers. These are the lines here below. This is using the federation feature that I showed you earlier. So you can have a shared folder with someone who is a different machine, in this case, site. Right? So you can have share your, your vacation photo album with your family, but there are some on a different hosting center, because when they signed up, one was full, and they were automatically um, uh, deployed in a different one, but you can still share your photos, and it just looks like local. It's just the same. Again, if you, um, if you want to share something with someone, again, the share dialog is asking the lookup server, where is this person located, and then a local share or a federated share. But the user doesn't even see it. It's completely transparent. Um, and the next thing we have is the balancer, because we can move users between the different sites at runtime. So you can, um, for example, if you say, well, this is like overloaded or, or this becomes a bit expensive and a different site is cheaper or faster to the user, or I don't know, we can export the user at one site, import it another one, um, um, fix the sharing information, and no one, no, one, no one is noticing it. When the user logs in for the next time, it's automatically at the right site. And um, yeah, all the shared information is, uh, is preserved. So this is the use case for big service providers. This architecture is also useful for companies um, because some companies have local sites. For example, you have an office in Hong Kong, you have an office in, the, in New York or something, and you can control which data is where. And you can also move people around. If someone then moves to a different continent and you have a fast access to the service, you can move it to a different, to a different site. So this is basically the, the cluster of cluster setups that, that we have here. So, summary. <laughs> um, Nextcloud is a full Microsoft 365 and Google Work alternative with the key difference that you can really host it and run it wherever and however you want it. Because of that, it's automatically compliant to whatever regulation you have because you decide about it. It has this great scalability from very tiny to very big. Uh, no foreign laws apply. So, of course, there's a reference to the Cloud Act um, because with some other hyperscalers, you have the problem with the Cloud Act. US law applies. A lot of people don't know that. Especially in Europe, it's widely ignored, which is a bit weird. But, um, yeah, if you store your data at some hyperscaler infrastructure, then automatically um, US law enforcement has access. Um, this is not the case here, obviously. Everything is 100% open source and free software, everything we do, and because of we have no vendor login. And now I hope I was fast enough that we have some time for questions. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Frank. Um, just a quick show of hands, who here already uses Nextcloud? There's quite a few of here, yep. Um, I'm also a user as, as, uh, of it as well. Um, and from, all from when it started of just like file exploring all the way up to the hub, it's great to see it sort of grow and everything. Um, and if there are any questions, we'd love to hear from anyone, yes? So, there we Hi, Frank. Oh, Thanks cool. for the presentation. <laughs> really awesome. So I'm interested in how Nextcloud is scaling uh, 
uh, with humans. So how big is the company now? How are you doing all this? So the whole client things is, uh, I guess it's really a lot of work and now you're doing an old file back, an own file back end and talk back end. So how many people are working on that in total? And how's the business side looking? So for example, if you're working for the German government, do they pay a consulting fee? Is there a support fee they pay or uh, how is this working? Okay, so this would make a complete uh, presentation Talk. on its own. <laughs> um, so um, first of all, we're doing quite well. Um, I'm still very happy that we are an independent company. We don't have any external investors or anything. We're completely independent. We are profitable. You have to if you don't have investors. Um, we are growing quite a lot the last year by 60%. Um, we have about 90 people now, so 90 full-time employed people at Nextcloud. But of course, that's the benefit of open source. We have our community. Mm -hmm. So in, in the core repository alone, we have over 2,000 contributors on GitHub who help with features and reviewing and bug fixes and testing and everything. Um, and all the app developers not even counted. So it's really, really one of the biggest open source projects with thousands of volunteers. For example, it's also available, I think, in 90 languages, including Klingon, very <laughs> important. Um, and uh, we don't even pay a single translator. Right? It's just all done by the community. So this really helped us a lot. Um, that was the next question. German government. Yeah, um, that's another interesting topic. <laughs> very cool in theory. But of course, if you're reading the press, then you know that they're moving very slow. So um, sometimes frustrating that you like give them some software that I could use today, but it took them years and years to actually roll it out. Um, yeah, but still cool, of course, that governments use Nextcloud and open source. Mm -hmm. What was the next question? I think I don't want to be the only one, but the <laughs> financial thing behind it, so support contract or Yeah, exactly, that's another thing. Another thing, so we don't do consulting at all. We are a software company, so we produce the software and give the software to our users and our customers. Um, if someone wants to have consulting, they should go to some company who does it for them. There are quite some in this room, so I think. Um, so th that's our model. We don't. We're not thanks. doing consulting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Leave guy at the front here. Uh, hello, thanks uh, for the talk. My name is Anton. Uh, I from, I'm from YDB. I have two questions, one small and uh, simple, and one I think is complex. First one, on this installment uh, with DB cluster, there was a DB cluster. So just out of curiosity, what software do you use to clusterize MySQL or Postgres? Uh, this is the first one. And the second, how do you transfer knowledge to the customers when you do this deployment? I guess on the infrastructure, there should be a team who serves the, the, the software you installed. How do you teach uh, people? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, for the database side, there is uh, MaxScale, which I think is a cluster solution. I think this is, uh, it, it goes a little bit beyond my knowledge, I have to be honest. Uh, there are um, open source cluster solutions for MariaDB and MySQL, and that's what we recommend. MaxScale, I think, is one. The other one I forgot. Um, yeah. Postgres, I'm not really sure. Um, as far as I know, it's not the biggest part of, a biggest strength of Postgres to run a cluster, at least not in the master master setup as we, as we need. Um, then the next question was the knowledge. How do you train the team on site when yeah. you install the, the, the solution? Yeah, so, so for scalability, and I mean company scalability reasons here, um, we really need to focus to do everything in the, in the right way. So we see ourselves as a software company, produce software, we produce documentation, we have a knowledge base for our um, customers. Um, uh, we do workshops and a little bit of trainings, but then it usually stops. So we rely on someone else doing actually the operations and running the, like installing, running the service. This is sometimes done by the customer themselves. Sometimes they have a good IT department, but in a lot of cases we involve like integration partners. We have lots of partners in Germany, all over Europe, and we call them and say, hey, um, this customer wants to use Nextcloud, but I don't have any knowledge how to scale it, how to backup it, how to monitor it. 
can you come in? And then they come in and then provide their services, while we provide uh, only the software. Got it, thanks. Uh, I believe there were some questions this side. Okay, you can. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Kurt from the Open Source Business Alliance. Um, I get two questions on the ethical AI thing, which I think is really interesting. I think you promised us four categories which you used to measure the ethicalness, which was open source, uh, open model, and open training data. I think you, you, you still owe us the fourth, or maybe uh, I misunderstood it's only three. No, there are three requirements, which then lead to four categories. Okay. So. Zero. You just told me earlier that you started to count with zero for your releases. <laughs> That's exactly the same thing here. You have zero, one, two, three, which is four categories for three requirements. All right. And then um, on the um, AI thing, I think you showed us that you can do a lot of things locally, which I think is great yeah. because you don't need to share your data. Yeah. But I think the example had uh, for the image generation, the OpenAI Dell E. So that was just wrong in the example, or is uh, image generation something you don't do locally yet? <laughs> no, no, it is. The thing is that we really get open source and local AI. And um, I think this is the future, and we have our dedicated AI team, and they're working on that part. But sometimes it's not doable because customers don't have local infrastructure, for example, or the local AI system is not good enough yet. This is why we have this configuration I showed you earlier, where you can say for what, voice to, to um, a speech to text, I want to use this service, an online service or a local service for image generation, local or remote. So we always, always have different options. And uh, the example was, I guess, then wrong, but on the other hand, not, because yeah, it's using the online DALI service, but you can also configure it to use a local one. So we have stable diffusion packaged locally, and you can run stable diffusion locally as an alternative. But it requires like a bit of a faster computer, or you need to wait a few seconds for the results. So you can always choose between different options. Great, thanks. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. There was another one around here somewhere. Uh, gentleman here, and there's one more at okay, the back. That's an easy yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, also regarding the um, AI side, um, regarding scalability, uh, like 20 million users, really a lot. Uh, what do you guess that you'd need on the AI side to kind of serve that amount of user base? It really depends what, what you're doing. So, um, so I'm not really sure what happens with this video, if I'm allowed to break any NDA here or not. <laughs> but, um, we actually have a discussion with one of the two case studies that I mentioned, one of the two organizations who um, have a ton of photos, they have millions of users who upload tons of photos, and they want to use our face detection and object recognition there. And then we had a workshop with them lately to calculate that. In their, in their example, I think the result was to do like the full object and face detection on a picture it takes like I don't know, 0.3 seconds or something. Um, and then we calculated um, that the amount of pictures they have to basically do it for everything. I think the result was that like one server needs like 10 years. Um, but they can also take like, I don't know, 100 servers and it's done in a few weeks. So, but of course it completely depends. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and uh, the gentleman just, just behind. Yep. This, yep. Um, still talking about the AI thing. When I upgrade my Nextcloud instance on next Saturday or next week or something, um, do I have um, automatically AI activated? Is, are there any defaults or do I have to manually do it, that, which I hope? Yeah. Yeah, that's not, not an important thing because a lot of people are skeptical about this AI feature. So none of that is enabled by default. Okay. And everything feature is optional. So if you don't like some of that, you don't need to enable it. So it's all optional. In Nextcloud, you always have these options with the different apps. You just enable the ones you like and the others not. Also with the AI things, it is a bit, it depends. Some things like the suspicious login detection, they are just, this is just simple PHP with one button, it's enabled, done, easy. Then um, some other things like the uh, translation system, and the object recognition, this is actually um, some uh, Python stuff, which is bundled. 
You can also enable it with one click if you want, um, but it needs to download quite some data. The models are not that small, so you download some, I don't know, gigabyte of data of the model. Um, and then some, some other things like the, the full assistant with the large language model, uh, very similar. So it's, this has actually as the backend uh, two options. There's a, a Falcon model or the Llama 2 model, and you have to cho can choose between those. And they're also like several gigabytes big. So this is, takes a little bit longer. And then in the future, as I said, when we are moving to this optional microservice architecture, then it needs some manual configuration, unfortunately. OK, thanks. Yeah. Okay, and that wraps everything up for the next Cloud Talk. A uh, little gift for our speaker. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. And one more time, thank you very much. Uh, Frank Karliczek. <laughs>